welcome to Coffee with the Risk Manager, where we share a cup of coffee with colleagues and discuss all things risk management and higher education. My name is Stacey Kroll. I'm Managing Director for Gallagher's Higher Education Practice. And with me today is Marge Lemon, a Risk Manager for Yale University. And on this episode, Marge and I are going to be diving into institutionally owned fine arts. So Marge, tell us a little bit about yourself. Good morning, Stacey. So I've been following this Coffee with the Risk Manager series diligently. I'm so happy to finally be a part of it. Um, but you're right. Like you said, I'm the risk manager at Yale University. Been here about 19 years. Um, and I have to say that when I started at Yale, I barely even know how to spell the word art. Didn't really have an appreciation for it. <laughs> Wasn't really familiar with it outside of paint by numbers or whatever. But um, live, you know, working at a place with such a huge collection in our museums and galleries really piqued my interest about, about art, my appreciation for it. It's, it's really been fabulous to the point where, you know, it bled over sort of into my personal life. Our town, ta- my town formed an arts alliance and I became a part of it from the very beginning. I actually even served as the president or interim president for a number of years. Um, and now I kind of sort of poorly manage the social media. Um, but it's a great organization. You know, we bring out the inner artist in every resident. That's our tagline. So, you know, it's really cool when professional life turns into personal life and, and art has become a big, huge part of my life now. And I love it. I love that. Uh, you're, you can see your passion in your face. Yeah, it's cool. So, um, so show me what you're working with for a coffee mug. And then let's talk about favorite piece of art for this episode. Oh, so, right. Um, what coffee mug and favorite piece yeah, of art? Yeah, let me, I have to think about that. I, I think, okay. Anyway, mug, um, Julie Gross hooked me up with the second edition of the Stacy Kroll Commander <laughs> Mug Collection. This is Stacy at Rest. I believe the original one was Stacy at Work. Um, no, but I'm joking. Actually, my, my, my mug is always a Dunkin' Donuts mug. So I have my iced <laughs> coffee and my Dunkin' Donuts mug with my Red Sox koozie. So you if you know me, you know that this is what I'm uh, what I'm usually drinking out of is some sort of Dunkin' Donuts mug. So um, <laughs> favorite art. So you know, I I I love like the Rembrandts, the Monets, like the, those types of impression and artists. But I do have to say, there's a, a particular artist. I believe his name is Dwayne Hansen, who um, creates like full-size models of human beings and you stick them in museums. There's a great one in the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford of a beachgoer. It's just this woman lying on a beach chair with the suntan lotion and the sunglasses and all that. There's one that, um, that Yale actually has in its collection called, uh, I think it's called the drug addict, which is really more boast, but um, it's just a guy that looks like a drug addict, but he does really interesting eclectic pieces of art. He's got them in, um, in or I think it's in the Orlando airport. There may be a display. So, Oh, I think I yeah. know. Yeah, I know who you're talking yeah. about. The rested traveler yes. or something in the exactly. Orlando airport. Yeah. So okay. those are a little bit more fun. I mean, I wouldn't have them in my house. I would have more, I would love to have a Monet in my house, but, um, but a different kind of piece of art that's, that it's, uh, it's a little bit off the, off the beaten path. Yeah, I, I love yeah. that. Um, so my mug today, because it's an art themed, is a local artisan. So to your point about kind of local art, um, and everybody's an artist, this is a local pottery mug yeah. that I bought at like a little art fair. Um, and then as far as favorite piece of art, we actually really um, enjoy a photographer from Martha's Vineyard. His name is Michael Blanchard, and um, he's now doing kind of cross-country, all-over-the-world photography, but he started his practice in uh, Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts, and he actually uses photography as um, a way to cope with his sobriety. Oh, so wow. a lot of his photos are through the lens of sobriety. They're very emotional, very touching, um, and we actually have a couple pieces um, in our house. So um, I encourage you to look him oh, up, too. Um, great. Yeah, art can be amazing therapy. It really can. Yeah. Yeah. So let's dive in. So when we talk Mm -hmm. about fine arts, we usually think about museum museum collections um, and kind of what you were saying, those Monet's, Monet's, kind of those big high value pieces. Um, However, in higher education, the variety and location um, of your art items can extend far beyond the four walls of your museum. So they can include rare books, they can include teaching collections that kind of move around your campus and end up in classrooms. They can be office art. (laughs) They can be in off-site storage facilities. Um, So my first question to you is, how do you determine kind of institutional exposure? How do you do that inventory of what you've got? 
Yeah, it, it, it's hard. Like you said, it can it takes many forms. You could have, you know, if you have a Heisman Trophy in your athletics department, that might be considered art. <clears throat> we do not have a Heisman Trophy, I don't think. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it could, be, could take that sort of form. It could be tapestries, like um, rugs, decorative things. You could have, if you have an archaeology department and you've done archaeological digs, some of the items from the digs could be considered art. You could have... Um, uh, like for commencement or say the institution, the, the installation of a new president, you may have a commemorative mace or scepter covered in jewels or a collar covered in jewels that someone might be wearing that be, could be considered art. So it could be everywhere, everywhere and anywhere on your campus. We actually have a Tiffany stained glass window in one of our classrooms that was installed in the 1890s. We have a Skinner wow. organ. Um, in our concert hall that was permanently installed in the wall in the early in the early um, 1900s. So those are all considered art, too. So it's there. It's all over the place. And, you know, so how do you find it? You know, if you're if you're a bigger institution like I am, you've got your museum curators and, and art ex experts. That's easier. If you're a smaller institution, you may need to become the subject matter expert. But there are so many people around your campus that wander around the campus all day long, that enlist them. So talk to your facilities people, talk to your security people. You know, they, they're in your buildings and around your campus all the time. Maybe they've walked by something a million times and noticed it, but never really thought about it. But if you bring it to their attention, they might be like, oh yeah, I saw a sculpture in this place, or I saw a thing, an item hanging on the wall in that place. And maybe they bring your attention they bring it to your attention so that you can then proceed accordingly. Um, but then obviously, once you know that it's there, you have to really start making a list and, and looking into it. And it is, is your collection big enough to justify a separate fine arts policy or is your property policy broad enough to cover it on that? So how do you value it? I mean, how do we even look at valuation? You just talked about a Tiffany, stain, yeah. original Tiffany stained glass window from the 1800s. How do you even put a value Yeah, on it's, uh, I mean, pardon the pun, but it's definitely an art, not a science. So, you know, there, there are experts out there. There are art experts out there for every kind of art uh, that you can enlist to help you do appraisals and putting values on things. There's ways that you can do research if you have uh, a work from a certain artist and another work from that same artist recently went up for auction. What did it auction off at? Or was it recently sold? What was it sold for? And you can kind of interpolate your values based on that. Um, insurers obviously have experts that they can help you uh, figure out the values of your items, but these are these are you know they're the part of the reason why they're art. They're irreplaceable items, so it's not as if you can you know go look at a very similar one and you know take that value and put it on yours. So everything's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah that's it's a nuance um, I think when you think about value and insurability um, and the decision about whether to insure to full value or replacement costs yeah. or kind of what your insurance strategy is. It's, it's definitely institutionally risk-based, yeah. um, appetite-based um, and individualized. So I wanna shift focus for a little bit. So in our industry in particular, we've been hearing um, a lot about Providence mm -hmm. um, and Providence is, you know, as, as you know, the ownership um, over a piece of art and this continuously comes mm -hmm. into question. Um, some of the things we've seen more recently are um, uh, uh, World War II art uh, kind of recovered during the Nazi invasion of Germany. Um, and then Native, art, Native American artifacts has been widely contested um, over the last several years. Um, I imagine that we're going to see a movement probably five, ten years or even sooner on that when we start talking about Ukrainian art yeah. and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. Where is that art coming yep. from? So can you lend any insight on kind of how provenance comes into play, how you think about it, and maybe some practices for just having good management? Yeah, of it? I mean, you are 100% correct. There have been stories in the news uh, over the last few months about art, a lot of art being um, taken from Mariupol and moved by the Russian military into the Russian controlled areas of the Ukraine. So you're right, 25, 50, 100 years from now, there will be disputes over the ownership of that art. Um, there have been a lot of museums and galleries uh, and, and even private collectors um, in the news fairly recently where they've had to return items that they thought were rightfully theirs. It was shown that it wasn't rightfully theirs. So there, there definitely needs to be a process. You need to know when someone is giving you or even selling you a piece of art uh, exactly 
where the where the title change was, what the change of ownership was, where it has transferred, where it originated. And you have to go into it sort of with an open eye, where if something is from a certain more susceptible area of time, like you said, the Nazi invasion, or even you know, go fast forward a few years, Ukraine, um, you have to pay special attention to it and really make sure you know what you're doing. Really research the people that are giving it to you or selling it to you. Mm-hmm. Have they been in the news? Is there any suspicion? What's their reputation? Um, you know, are they well known and, and well respected, or is it somebody that you don't know anything about? Um, have a process that the important thing is to just really be consistent about a process. So, you know, have your checklist, ask your questions for every single item that you get. And not only for incoming things, take a look at everything that you have currently in your collection. You know, especially if you mm-hmm. hear something in the news about, um, um, you know, a certain col- a certain uh, seller who sold something and it turned out to be not rightfully owned by them. Go back and look at your list. Did you get anything from this person? Is there anything that you need to really look into? Because maybe you have you're in the same situation that this other party was in. Mm-hmm. So not only be do not only your due diligence for what you're acquiring now, but looking back at what you have acquired and making sure that um, you you do rightfully own it and there's no suspicion about whether you actually own it or not. That's great. Um... So shifting focus again, pivoting again, um, controls. Mm-hmm. So you had said, right, you're not, you, you've you developed a, an interest and yeah. um, some, some background knowledge on fine arts, but it's not very common for risk managers to be fine arts experts. Yeah. Um, you also have a team supporting you at Yale. So when it comes to controls, how does a like what are the basics that a risk manager needs to kind of know, particularly for our kind of shops of one yeah. or, or offices of one? What are the basic controls that they need to be aware of? And um, I'm wondering what resources you found as you've kind of um, uh, gathered your knowledge on this topic. Yeah, I, I would say there's probably three key areas. There's environmental controls, security controls, and then just knowing what you have, what you have, right? So uh-huh. environmental controls are a little bit of it, a lot of this is common sense, like much of risk management is common sense. So mm-hmm. environmental controls, you know, what's, do you have temperature controls? Do you have humidity controls where these items are being stored? Are they in wet, you know, high humidity, moist areas, that type of stuff? You obviously paper goods, paintings, items like that may be more susceptible to humidity or temperature issues than say a, you know, a, a sculpture or glass or something like that. But so make sure that you've got the controls. We had a we had an exhibit recently of um, rare maps in our rare book library. And in the each one of the glass cases, there was a monitor monitoring what the temperature and the humidity was oh. in those to make sure that the paper was staying at the proper temperature and humidity. And again, there are experts out there that can tell you what the proper levels are. Uh, the second the second one is security. You know, are you leaving these things unattended in the open in a building that anybody can walk in and out of at any time? Like what kind of controls are you monitoring it? Do you have security guards? Um, are you having events in the space? And if you're having events in the space, you know, are there is there food and drink that could possibly you know damage the items? Or are you allowing people close enough that they could bump into it? I You know, in Seattle, we went to the Chihuly Museum, and that is heavy-duty glass, and it's hard to knock over any of that. But I'm still walking through the museum thinking, oh, my gosh, I can walk right up to this piece. But they were very well secured on their base. you know. So if you're having the public go through or people going through, make sure they're protected. But so really, monitor it, um, protect it, make sure that you know um, where it is. The third part of it is uh, the inventory and cataloging. So have your full list of inventories of all of the items that you have. Have digitized photographs of it. Sometimes uh, there are two items of something out there and there could be a, a teeny little difference in the two of them. With a digitized photograph, if something happens, um, say they're both stolen, you can show which one was yours because you have the documentation. Uh-huh. It also helps with insurance to really show what it is that you had and the quality of the item you had. Um, so not only inventory it, and, and I'm mean, sorry, not only catalog it, document what you have, what it looks like, take the, the pictures, but also periodically inventorying it to make sure it still is where it's supposed to be so that you don't go back 10 years later and, and you're suddenly like, where was that thing? I last saw it in you know 1985. <laughs> so uh, those are really the three biggest things. There's environmental, there's security, and then there's the inventory and, and cataloging. And 
Um, again, a lot of this is not, it's, it, you know, it's pretty much common sense, but there are a lot of really good resources out there. There are museum resources and library resources that you can find online oh. um, that give you all the tips that you should think about, especially if you're a one person shop or you don't have a huge museum or gallery or, right. or art curators on campus that can help you with that. So maybe we can provide links um, to people for those sorts oh, of yeah. resources. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. We'll do like a supplement with this video okay. um, with a list of those resources. Okay. Um, so that's That'd great. be awesome. Yeah. Um, so we're like at time, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we haven't even scratched the surface on this, right? So we're, again, the scope of this conversation was really institutionally owned art and kind of stuff on your campus. We should definitely do a part two where we talk about kind of loans, yeah. um, outgoing, incoming, and kind of when we send stuff yeah. off, when we bring in, and kind of risk management protocols around. Yeah, that. totally so, different um, type of I'll risk. Probably reach out. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll probably. Yeah, um, we'll reach out and we'll schedule another call okay. on this. Um, but March, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, this has been a great conversation. And um, yeah, you from going from not being able to spell art uh, to what you know today, you've certainly learned a lot. Um, so thank you for sharing that uh, with our audience. Thanks, it was um, fun. And have a great thank day. You too. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>